Amen. All right. You ready, Joey? You ready for this one? All right, check it out. He was considered to be the most powerful man in the world of his time. In fact, this man was looked upon as a god. What he said went, and if you dare disagree, you died. Now, Holly, it's not Tom. I know you're probably thinking that, whatever, but he's a cool guy. No, but one day, two men showed up to this guy's throne, not to listen uh, to his orders, but to give this guy an order. And they told him that uh, he was to let his slave workers go so they could go and worship the one and only true God. Well, naturally, uh, nobody tells this guy what to do. And so, and who do these people think they are giving this guy an order, okay? Besides, uh, this guy was the main God that people were to worship. Yet the men not only persisted, they now proceeded to give this guy a warning. And they said that if he didn't obey their command, he and his whole kingdom would be judged. Well, the war was on. The battle of the gods commenced. The first judgment upon this man was a plague upon the river, and it turned to blood. But he still refused to obey. The second plague was a plague of frogs, but he still refused to obey. The third was a plague of gnats, but he still refused to obey. The fourth was a plague of flies, but guess what, Joey? He still refused to obey. That's right. The fifth was a plague that uh, killed all his livestock, but he still refused to obey. The sixth was a plague of boils, but he still refused to obey. The seventh was a plague of hail destroying all his crops, but he still refused to obey. You're seeing the pattern. The eighth was a plague of locusts, but he still refused to obey. The ninth was a plague of darkness, but he still refused to obey. Every single one of these judgments, listen, was not just an attack on this man. Every single one was designed to be an attack on all his gods, including himself. And that's why the final and tenth judgment was pronounced. The firstborn of everyone who belonged to this man's kingdom would die. And sure enough, because of the stubbornness of this one man, the cries rang out, every firstborn child had died, including this man's own son. And so it was only then that this stubborn, foolish, prideful man would finally obey. He let the people go. Now, the book is, of course, Exodus, and the judgment, of course, is what? The ten plagues of Egypt, right? And how many guys have heard about the ten plagues of Egypt? Okay, most of us, hopefully, especially if you ever went to Sunday school, it seems to be a popular topic, okay? But as we saw, folks, this is from the Scripture. This is not make-believe. This is not just a Sunday school story or some cartoon story. This really happened. This is an actual account of what? It's an account when God Almighty poured out His wrath on a wicked and rebellious nation called Egypt, Right? It really happened. And so here's the point when you take a look at this. Old Testament, New Testament, it's all over the place. God is a God who will judge, right? God is a God who does not mess around with sin. And one day when you least expect it, if you don't knock it off, he's going to judge it. That's what you get when you read the scripture. So here's the point. You would think that people in our world today would stand up and take notice, okay, when God talks about a future coming judgment, that his son, Jesus Christ, is coming back. The first time, praise God, he was the lamb who was slaughtered on our behalf. The second time, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's the one who's going to be dishing out the beating, okay? You would think that people would uh, stand up, and they would say, hey, whoa, okay, man, I, I, I see that you judge sin in the past. You've said you're going to judge it again in the future. I better get right with God so I don't suffer the coming judgment of God. You would think that's the logical response, right? What's the problem? It's not today, because the lie of evolution, our skeptical, scoffing society, has brainwashed people not only in having a hard time in believing in God. Listen to this. Have you, have you noticed this? People today, even if they want to believe in the God, one thing they are absolutely adamant, I refuse to believe in, is that God is a God who will judge. Because my God is a God of love, right? He would never do that, right? So it's both things. Not just they have a hard time believing in God, they have a hard time and believing that there is a future coming judgment of God. But folks, the Bible is clear. God judged this planet once with the worldwide flood. He's going to judge this planet again. And the point is, you better get ready. And the Bible says in the last days, scoffers would come, okay? And they're going to be willingly ignorant of the fact that God is a God who will judge sin, and he's about to do it again. You better get ready. Therefore, in order to help these scoffers, okay, uh, get equipped with the fact, hopefully before it's too late, we're going to continue in our study uh, the witness of creation. And you guys know what we're doing is we're taking a look at the different evidences that God's left behind for us to show us he's not just real, uh, but we really can have a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Anybody excited about that? Okay. Now, in the context of our new study, I want to add this phrase, before it's too late. Because it's not going to happen forever. Okay. There is a day when it hammer's coming down, it's too late, you messed up, you missed the opportunity, just like the people of Noah's day. You ever wonder, Ruth, 
if the people in Noah's day, because he was in that ark for seven days, if when the rain started, they didn't start knocking. And then when it really started to get bad, they started pounding. I wonder what he heard on the outside, but it was too late. They had their opportunity. Folks, it's the same thing that's going to happen today. Okay. Now, God's given us this amazing evidence that we can have a relationship with him through Jesus before it's too late in a bunch of different ways. We've already seen that first evidence was the evidence of an intelligent creation. The second evidence was the evidence of a young creation or young earth. And then we saw the third one was the evidence of a special creation exposing all the lies of evolution. And last time, if you were here, uh, we saw it was the evidence of a judge creation. And what we did is take a look, okay, what about this biblical account of a worldwide flood? Did God really judge this whole planet uh, with a worldwide flood? Yeah. And what we saw is it's not just we believe that as Christians just because the Bible says so, nothing wrong with that, but we saw because when we did the homework and checked out the facts, there's tons of proof. And the proof that we saw that there really was a global catastrophe called the worldwide flood was the evidence of languages, let us know that truth, the evidence of lineages, and the evidence of uh, legends. Almost nearly 500 different cultures around the planet, outside the Bible, have records of a worldwide flood in their records, okay? And so you would think if there really was a worldwide flood that we would find somebody else talking about it outside the Bible. Mm, we do, <laughs> all over the place, okay? There's no need to scoff. Okay, and there's no need to be willingly ignorant. There's tons of proof that God judges world once. He's fixing to do it again. And the point is, you better get ready. You better make your, sure that you're in the boat before it's too late. The second evidence we're going to deal with tonight, that God really did judge this world once, specifically with the worldwide flood, and that's the evidence of a great fossilization. And it's kind of funny. You should, every time you dig in the dirt, every time you find a fossil, you should say, whew, God hates sin, because that's where it came from. Okay, And it works like this, folks. You would think that if there really was a worldwide flood that wiped out virtually every single thing on the planet, okay, uh, you would think you would expect to find tons and tons and tons and tons of dead things, i.e. fossils all over the planet. Hey, Tom, guess what we find? <laughs> exactly that, right? Where in the world do you think they came from? This is hilarious. Everybody's always looking. Look at the History Channel, whatever. Oh, it was a meteor that came and smashed into the earth. No, it was a comet and it spread this deadly gas. No, it was this. Blah, blah. And everybody wants to skip the obvious thing. Hey, how about a, a flood? Oh, no, you can't talk about that. As we saw, and we'll get in later when we get on to the issue of dinosaurs, they'll come up with any theory, including that the dinosaurs died out because of constipation or backaches or they just became dumb. I'm not making that up. That would be dumb, but no, no. So, <laughs> right? I'm going extinct. Oh, no. Okay, no. Anything and everything but a worldwide flood, okay? Now, what we're going to see tonight, folks, and when you take a look at the facts on the geological evidence, specifically all these dead carcasses we find, it isn't just that it was caused by a worldwide flood, okay? Skip the comet thing, the meteor thing, whatever you want to do. It was a flood, but it was only a flood that could produce this. You're not going to get the same effects with all these other things, okay? But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at our opening text tonight, Genesis 7, and let's see why in the world we find billions and billions of dead things uh, all over the planet. Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, if you guys are interested, it's on uh, page 6 in my Bible, uh, if you're wondering, uh, Ruth. If you got large print, it might be on page 27 in yours, but we'll move on. Uh, Genesis 7. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. We're going to hit this later, this chapter, uh, in our study a couple different times. But let's take a look at this first chunk here in the context there. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. When you get there, say moo. Moo, all right, let's take a look. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And here's what you do. You need to take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep uh, their various kinds alive throughout the earth, he says. Seven days from now, now notice God called it out specifically. Okay, seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I am going to wipe from the face of the earth, listen, every living creature I have made. And Noah said, God, you can't do that. Uh, football season just started. How about seven months from now? Oh, I'm sorry, wrong translation. And what, you got that news from, this really happened. Can you imagine God showing up one day and giving you this news? You got seven days. And this planet is destroyed. Get in the boat. 
What do you say? Yes, sir. How high, sir? What else, sir? <laughs> yeah, and that's what we see. Noah, what? What did it say there? Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Okay? This really happened, folks. This isn't just some cartoon caricature. Noah is a real guy, and this is really what happened that day. But what we see in the Bible, it clearly states that precisely seven days from this announcement to Noah, from God, that God was going to what? He was going to, he gave Noah a heads up, but nobody else knew, okay, as far as we know. So he was going to surprise, God was going to surprise the world with a worldwide flood, okay? And according to our text, the result of that surprise is what? Okay, all of a sudden, when you least expected it, every single living thing on the earth, the air-breathing land animals, the scripture talks about, bang, you're dead. You're dead. It's over. It's done, right? Only those who were in the ark were going to be saved. And so this is the question. Let's start examining this text and this chapter, and let's take a look. Is this really what we see in the evidence in the uh, earth around the planet? Do we see any evidence of tons and tons of former living things? Listen, not just dead, but do we see them dying in a surprising fashion, very quickly, almost like, whoa, caught off guards, too late, uh buried in the dirt. Do we see any evidence of that? Yes, we do. And we find it, of course, all over the world. And the first way we do that is with sudden death and burial. This is all over the planet, folks. This isn't just a few isolated places. They find evidence of absolute sudden death and burial, like some sort of catastrophe came upon the world and <gasps> it was too late. And everything got buried in quick fashion. Here's some evidence. First of all, here's a picture of not just a fish, uh, but just a fossilized fish, but a fossilized fish swallowing a fish. This thing died so fast, it died in mid-bite and was buried. Okay? Now, obviously, that was a chicken fish, and it was choking to death. No, I'm just kidding. I was, uh, the, you know, skeptics would come up with something like that. But anyway, uh, but no, that, that's how fast this thing died, right? Now, by the way, uh, they say it takes millions of years for something to turn into fossil. In our previous study on young earth, we saw that's a bunch of baloney, right? Uh, but first of all, if this was just some, uh, maybe he did choke on a chicken fish, all right? If it's laying, as evolution would say, laying out there in the middle of the whatever, it's going to be scavenged. There's not going to be any evidence. It's going to be picked apart, bones and all, and you're not going to have anything left to, to fossilize, right? So this thing fossilized very quickly, very rapidly. That's what you would have if you did have a sudden surprise worldwide flood okay, on the planet. And this isn't the only one. There's thousands of these finds, folks, all over the world, which is exactly what you would expect, not just with a worldwide flood, but... A quick one, a sudden one. Wait till we get to some future studies. The Hebrew, we're going to peel into that. I mean, it was, you were done. It happened so fast, it was just, wow. Okay, and now here's a fossilized 14-foot fish with a smaller fish, as you can see, inside of its stomach, okay, which was probably the breakfast earlier that morning. But it, the point is, it didn't even have time uh, for it to digest. And then all of a sudden, it was fossilized, okay? And that's, again, exactly what you would expect if there's a sudden, quick, worldwide flood. Now, speaking of rapid, here's a fossil of a pregnant ichthyosaur, okay, giving birth. I know it looks pretty icky, doesn't it? Thank you, Tom, and whoever else back there uh, made that chuckle. Uh, but now, uh, pregnancies, I know, can seem to take like millions of years, but obviously this one didn't even make it to the finish line. So this one died literally while it was giving birth, all of a sudden, very quickly, very rapidly, okay? And, and again, this is what you'd expect to find if there was a rapid burial, rapid death, a rapid catastrophe burying things all over uh, the planet, okay? Now, here's a picture of two dinosaurs that died while they were fighting. This is amazing, folks. Something rapidly killed these things. Now, again, what is the evolution? Oh, no, uh, these things that we find fossilized, they just died. And, and then over millions of years, they got covered up by dirt and all this. No, these things died so fast, they literally were in the middle of a battle. Okay, this is what they found. That Velociraptor has its foot claw embedded into the neck of a protoceratops, and in turn, the protoceratops appears to have bitten and broken the right arm of the vo uh, Velociraptor. Okay, is the pose that they're striking there. Now, that's the issue. Now, did these dinosaurs strike a pose for millions of years, right? Hey, we're going to mess with those creationists, Bob, right? About two million years from now. Okay, what you do is we're first of all going to go and agree to die at the same time somehow. But what you do is you, you bite my neck. <laughs> Right here, and then you, and then I'll act like I'm giving you a right uppercut, and then we'll stay there until millions of years later I get buried. It's ridiculous, folks. These guys died very rapidly, suddenly, 
And by the way, they were not scavenged. How, how could, if they were scavenged, would they still have that pose? No, they'd be torn apart, broken apart, right? But they died very rapidly. Common sense tells us they've died literally in mid-swing, and that's exactly what you would find in a worldwide flood. Here's a fossilized fern that was fossilized before it had time to wilt. Anybody any good with plants? I don't have a green thumb. I got a brown toe. You guys got one of those? I'm not good, but if those of you are good with plants, if you ever owned a fern, how long does it take for a fern to wilt? Right? This thing was fossilized, buried so rapidly, it didn't have even time to wilt. Something rapidly, quickly happened, okay? And so that's exactly what you would expect, again, in a worldwide flood. Now, here's a picture of a fossilized jellyfish. Now, look at that. I mean, it's even still got the, the individual little, whatever you call those tentacle things or whatever, uh, hanging down there. And uh, the last time I checked, the anatomy of a jellyfish doesn't have a long shelf life, right? It's called jelly for a reason, right? And uh, here's the picture one on the beach. It's starting to boom, turn into, okay, I could have said it was chicken because it really does look like it. But anyway, but no, it's a jellyfish. Uh, and it could be avoid a scavenge, right? I mean, you find them on the beach, what happens? Do they stay in that perfect shape? No, they start to turn into a blob and then eventually they get picked apart and they disappear, right? But that's not what we find. Now, listen to this. This is wild. Common sense tells us that, therefore, this fossilized jellyfish happened very what? Very, very rapidly. Now, this is what's mind-blowing, folks. Remember, it was a worldwide flood, okay? The evolutionist, by the way, who discovered this fossilized jellyfish said that, quote, the fossil must have been formed in less than 24 hours. Wait a second, I thought you said it takes millions of years for something to fossilize. But you're realizing because of the nature of a jellyfish and how you found it, it had to happen very quickly, in his own words, within 24 hours. Now, that's not the half of it. The other half is this. He didn't mean just one jellyfish in 24 hours. He meant millions of jellyfish, along with other life forms they found fossilized throughout the entire formation, would stretch for about 300 miles. Something massive, some like massive wave and earth and stuff just came over a whole giant area and went boom and fossilized a bunch of things. That's what we find in the dirt. Hey, that's exactly what you'd expect to find if there really was a massive worldwide flood. Okay, now, not only that, they also find tons of fossilized animal tracks all over the world that tells us had to be uh, fashioned uh, rapidly. And they even find, listen to this, this is what this is. This is fossilized raindrop marks. Now that's a rapid burial. Okay? Now I don't want to get dogmatic or anything, but wouldn't it be interesting if we just saw the actual fossil remains of the actual rain during the flood of Noah? How many guys would like to have that as a conversation piece on your coffee table? Get your skeptic friends over. Hey, see that fossil? You better get in the boat. All right? Too late. You should listen to Noah, okay? You should listen to Jesus today, okay? But here's the point, folks. When you take a look at the evidence of what we do find on the earth, this, this, this obvious evidences of plants and animals, all these remains, they weren't just tons of them. They were rapidly buried, and that's exactly what you would find, okay, uh, on a massive scale if there really was a worldwide flood, right? And not just a bunch of them, but again, in sudden surprising fashion because it was a rapid event, okay, according to the Bible. Now, here's the point. If you took a look at this information and you dealt with it honestly, and you still walked away and said, no, 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 you guys are a bunch of balonies. You're the one who's being willingly ignorant of the fact. And the irony, the sad irony is the very same Bible that you're scoffing about, even though we can back it up with factual data, is the very same Bible that you would do that specifically in the last days before the next coming judgment. Scoffing generation would come. The second evidence that we know that we have a great fossilization that was produced by a worldwide flood uh, is the appearance of swirling graveyards. Now, this is wild, okay? It's not just that we find massive, massive amounts of dead things, but uh, they're all in these bits and pieces and parts, and they're all in this swirling fashion, almost like somebody had them in a bathtub, and they all rotted, and the plug was pulled, and, and they all... That's what we find on a massive scale around the planet. Let's take a look at that text again. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 7, further down this time. Uh, verse 20 through 21, the waters rose, okay, so now it's been going on for a while, the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than what? 20 feet. How many guys are 20 feet tall? How many guys would say, even if you could make it to the top of the mountain, glub glub was your future, okay? So God made sure that nobody was going to survive except for those who made it on the ark. Now, 
Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth and all of mankind. Okay? And so what we see in the same exact chapter, for a second time, the Bible declares that not just a few things died during this flood, which dispels what some people, unfortunately, even the church would say, oh, no, 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 this was just a local flood. Oh, I'm sorry, if a flood goes over the top of the mountain, where does the water continue to go? To the next one, and the next one. <laughs> Hello? Okay, and that's a whole other topic, okay? But the Bible clearly says that there was not just a few things, but once again, in the same chapter, tons and tons and tons, and it said right there, tons and tons of creatures buried everywhere. So let's put it to the test. Do we see any evidence of not just a sudden death and burial, but do we see evidence of a massive burial? I mean a massive, because this is a whole global event, okay? Tons and tons of carcasses buried in the planet. Mm, yeah, and let's take a look at that evidence today, uh, Tom, as well. First of all, they not only find tons and tons of dead things around the world, but they find so many of them, they actually have been given them a name. They're called fossil graveyards. See, when you go to a museum, folks, you might see a, a fossil over here, and you walk a little ways, you see a fossil over here, and you see over here, okay? And it's very rare that they find one in complete form. Why? Because they are just a bunch of messed up bones and pieces of carcasses all over the planet. But there's tons of them, okay, all over the place. When they find them in these massive graveyards, it's just an amazing sight. And these are actual pictures of them. Look at all that. It's just a massive bunch of bones. And they not only contain tons and tons of fossils, but they find them all jumbled up, thrown together in a completely disordered mass, exact, exactly like you'd expect to find in a sudden violent flood, literally shredding things apart, as well as you're going to see them begin to fall apart. Uh, those that weren't immediately buried, okay, are going to float, right? But, and the flood lasted for over a year, and so eventually parts and pieces of them are going to break off and rot you know, and fall and then sink. And so you're going to have parts and pieces and mixed up. That's exactly what we find, okay? And that agrees with the biblical account. In fact, the pictures of these dinosaur graveyards often show people chiseling out of a backbone of an animal that has no legs, no head, tail, or rib cage attached to it with no teeth marks on the bone, okay? Now that's important uh, because that shows it wasn't scavenged, as they would say. And next to it is, and here's another picture. Look at that. That's just a massive jumbled up mess of parts and pieces of carcasses. This wasn't just, oh, hey, Bob just happened to die over here, and then here comes Charlie the dinosaur, and he happened to fall on top of him, and then here comes Susie the buffalo, I guess. Let's switch it up a little, Bruce, <laughs> and she dies here. No, it's just uh, parts and pieces. And they're all bent, they're all twisted up, parts and pieces, and this shows that these uh, were not torn apart by scavengers, rather than the remains of a swirling mass of rotting animal parts that were deposited at the flood. In fact, even the secular researchers admit it's almost like a flood came through here or something, right? Listen to their words, folks. This is wild. Quote, we have huge mass graves where dinosaur fossils are jumbled together like flotsam after a flood. I wonder what flood that was. Interesting. Another researcher said at this spot in Wyoming, the fossil hunters found a veritable mine of dinosaur bones. The concentration was so remarkable, they were piled like logs in a dam. Interesting. That's what you'd expect in a flood. In fact, there's so many animals jam-packed in the graveyards, they're oftentimes two to three miles thick of bones, and they're found all over the world. This is not a local event, folks. In fact, this is cool, and this is an actual picture. Uh, in one site alone, this uh, Caro beds in Africa, there's an estimated 800 billion, not million, billion remains uh, and even after decades of fossil collecting, the bones are still sticking out of the ground and stretch for hundreds of miles. There's carcasses everywhere on the planet. Okay? Tons of them. Okay? And that's exactly what you would find uh, if a worldwide flood happened. And talk about mass graves, they even find whole herds of them. Right? How does this happen? You get a whole herd of animals, they say, hey, let's all commit suicide. Something destroyed them in massive quantities. Check this out. One site in Sicily, there's so many fossilized hippopotamus bones that even today they dig them out with bulldozers to use to, them to make charcoal. A ma something huge, something, I wonder what it could have been, Tom. There's this massive, mega, giant herd of hippopotamuses, and something just went, whoa, boom, buried them. And now today they dig them up for charcoal. I wonder why I could do that. Very interesting. 
And, and this also explains why they found, listen, not one, not ten, not a thousand, ten thousand hadrosaurs, there was a herd of them, in one mountain alone, all jumbled together in what appears to be a massive death. Literally wiped them out just like that. Very interesting. In fact, here's a picture in Fife, uh, sure, England. They found more than 1,000 fish jammed into one square yard. Just massive amounts, concentrated fish, land, animal, everything just goes boom and just got deposited and fossilized, and that's what we find buried in the dirt. Okay, one guy said this, modern geology cannot explain fossil graveyards, and many geologists admit this. <clears throat> These graveyards are a dramatic evidence that the era of the world ended with enormous violence. Interesting. And finally, just like you'd expect if there really was a worldwide flood, these bones are not only found in massive quantities, they're found in massive mixed-up quantities, right? Because if you can imagine the giant waves coming through, it's grabbing everything in its path, right? Plants, animals, you name it, whatever, it's all going in, right? That's also exactly what we find as well. In Florida, in one site just south of Tampa, they discovered the bones of more than 70 different species of animals, including camels, horses, mammoths, bears, wolves, large cats, a bird with an estimated wingspan of 30 feet, okay, and mixed in with all these land animals in the same spot, okay, were sharks' teeth, turtle shells, the bones of fresh and saltwater fish, and the bones are all smashed and jumbled together as if by some catastrophe. Something came through there and got everything its past path, boom, dropped it, and that's what we see uh, today. One person said, the big question is, how in the world could bones from different ecological niches, the plains, the forest, the ocean, come together in the same place. A flood. That's right, Don, I saw you back there. A flood. Good answer. I don't know if you can catch this, but here's your piece of gum for tonight. We'll get it later, but that's right. Uh, yeah, a flood, Don. Give it, hey, give it up for Don, right? You know what I'm saying? He's back there. All right, he got the right answer. There's a worldwide flood. That's another, this is cool, too. Malta, on the island of Malta, there are so many lions, tigers, mammoths, birds, beavers, hippopotamus, foxes, all mixed together, fossilized. Listen, that Malta's present size could not kept this amount of animals alive for even one week. So you can't even say that they're native there, and they just all just happen to die there. Something huge, something massive, literally just brought all these mass carcasses, and it, boom, landed right there. That's what you find. I wonder what caused that. That's a flood. That's right. Hey, all right. I only got three more pieces left. But anyway, uh, Siberia, all right? Now, this is pretty interesting. Listen to this. Buried in the frozen tundra on a scale, this is their word, so awesome and stupendous that utterly defies description. There's countless mammoths, elephants, buffaloes, horses, lions in Siberia, foxes, camels, a whole ton of other kinds of species include great species of fish in Siberia. By the way, that's in Land area? Okay. In fact, for the mammoths alone, they find an estimate there are as many as 5 million mammoths in titanic graveyards. In fact, some of these fossils are still today so well preserved that they even use their flesh to feed husky dogs. When they're up there discovering these things, dogs got to eat something because some of the mammoths are still sticking up out of the ground. They're frozen now, but something buried them on a massive, massive, massive scale. Well, well first of all, that, that's, that's a problem on a, a bunch of different levels. First of all, what's going to squish all those animals up in Siberia? Animals that aren't even native to Siberia. But wait a second, I thought you said it took millions of years for things to form, and yet some of their flesh is still fresh enough to feed to the dog. Well, that would work if you believed in a worldwide flood that was roughly about 4,400 years ago and has been kept frozen up that far. But it doesn't make sense with evolution. Okay? And this is the point, folks. You know, one guy, he says this, he goes, hmm, if there really was a great flood, Okay, you would expect to find uh, the fossil record to reveal billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what we do find in the fossil record is billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. What do you know? Shocker, right? And we're the ignorant ones? Now listen, folks, you put this to the test. It's not just that this is interesting. It proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, listen, that not only there was a worldwide flood, but only a worldwide flood explains why we see these things in this kind of fashion, okay? And so once again, if you unfortunately take a look at all this information, and even just this piece of information, and literally walk away and say, oh, you Christians, you're a bunch of ignorance, right? You have no, you're just a bunch of brainwashed Bible thumpers, right? You're the one who's being willingly ignorant. Yes, we believe in the scripture, we do not budge on that. But because God doesn't lie, when you take a look at the facts and you're honest with them, Shocker, they agree with the biblical account. We're the ones 
who are not being willingly ignorant. One more to go for tonight, the great fossilization. How do we know? Because we not only have massive amounts of evidence from the animals, but also plants. And I mean plants on a massive scale. Okay, let's once again go back to the Genesis account, specifically chapter 27, read a little bit further. Genesis chapter 7, now verse 22 through 23. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils, what? Died. You weren't going to make it unless you were in the boat. Every living thing, everything, okay, animals, plants, you name it, on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Okay? So once again, we see now for the third time in the exact same chapter, we see that the Bible clearly says that every single living thing on the face of the earth that had the breath of life in it was wiped out by the flood. And so common sense tells us then that this would therefore not only include all the uh, breathing life animals on the land, but it would include the plants that are on the land, right? Okay, wait till we get to some of that stuff. Did you know in the pre-flood atmosphere, we have found fossil records of trees that were 1,000 feet tall? Massive, mega plants. I mean, talking huge plants, okay? But anyway, but those would have to go too if there was a, a worldwide flood. And that's the question. Do we see not only evidence of tons and tons and tons of animals, mass graves, swirling graves, parts and pieces of the planet, but do we find massive amounts of plants being buried too? Big ones. Yeah, you guys are starting to see the pattern. We see lots of it. In fact, it's all over the world. This is cool. First of all, just like the names given to massive animal remains, uh, they also have given uh, the same names to plant remains, uh, dinosaur graveyards or fossil graveyards. They do the same thing with plants. They call them forest beds, not plant beds, forest beds. Huge, massive amounts. Have, were suddenly buried. And what's interesting is that their roots do not end in small fibers, but they are broken off anywhere from one to three feet from the trunk. Right? If, some, if it was just, oh, the tree just happened to fall over, what happened? The bottom of the tree lifts up. You see all the roots and all the fibers. That's not what you find. Something came across here and just whoo, sheared them right off. Okay? And this shows us they were violently ripped from their original location and deposited to their new location. Some huge... I wonder what it was, Tom. Some huge, massive thing. I don't know, maybe a wave or something. Like, we can't even begin to dream. Came through and hit the land and just started shearing trees off, grabbing animals, and boom! And deposited miles and miles and miles and miles away. And just like with the animal remains, we also find the plant remains mixed up from all over the world. Okay, this is pretty cool. Uh, for instance, they have discovered an abundant supply of fossilized subtropical plants in Idaho. How did they get to Idaho? Idaho is not known for its... Uh, how many guys, if you had your choice between the Bahamas or Idaho, would go to Idaho? Sorry, those of you listening from Idaho. No offense. But no, if you want that subtropical feel, you don't go to Idaho. How did they get to Idaho? Unless something brought them up there in a massive scale. In Wyoming, they find fossilized palm leaves. I've been through there several times. I haven't seen any palm trees. Right? You get sweaty palms driving when your air conditioner goes out. Boy, I remember that time. But you don't find home. What? How'd they get there? That's interesting. In Alaska, they found subtropical uh, species of the magnolia and the fig. How'd that make it to Alaska? In fact, large fossilized trees are found near the North and South Pole. Wait a second. How'd they get there? That's interesting. In fact, in Antarctica, some of the trees are 24 feet long and 2 feet thick. They're big trees. How'd they get there? I don't know, I'm kind of thinking maybe a flood. Okay, I'll answer that because i got to keep holding my gum. But that's not all. Not only do we find uh, mixed up plant remains all the world, we find them mixed up with the animal remains all over the world, which again is what you would expect. If you can picture these massive giant waves, here they come again. It's grabbing everything, plants, animals, everything, and that's exactly what we find on a massive scale. In England, in one forest bed in England, they discover plants from the Arctic. Again, what's that doing in England? And it was uh, the dwarf birch and the Arctic willow. But they also found mixed in with the plants the bones of various birds, frogs, snakes, bison, bear, musk, ox, wolverine, saber-toothed tiger, mammoth, elephant, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, and England. Anybody ever been to England? Don't you hate it when you're driving around there? You're just trying to find Big Ben. You're on the 18th time going around that circle thing. I can't get out of here, but help, help, right? And you're trying to be a godly couple, right? And you... <laughs> And, and it's just the, those goofy rhinoceros just keep getting in your way. You finally get the way out. Here they comes again. I just kind of, there it is. Ah, oh, the hippopotamus blocked my way. I, how many guys hate it when you go to England and you're those 
what in the world is a rhinoceros doing in England? Or hippopotamus? How did it get there? That's the common sense question, okay? One researcher said this. He says, what in the world could have brought together in quick succession all these animals and plants from the tundra to the Arctic Circle, from the jungles of the tropics, from lush oak forests, from the desert, from lands of many latitudes and altitudes, from freshwater lakes and rivers, and from the salt seas of the north and south. I wonder what that was. Blood. Now, I said it real quick because I'm holding on to my gun. Okay. Uh, conclusion? This is their conclusion. They proposed there, there must have been some immense flood of some sort. Duh, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything but a worldwide flood. You don't want to go there, okay? Uh, but that's normal. We not only find uh, mixed up plant remains all the world, but tons of them on a massive scale, okay? In fact, they find entire forests buried underground. Listen to what this article shared. Uh, a carboniferous forest extending some four square miles has been found in the ceiling of a coal mine. About 50 species have been identified, including ferns and horsetails, over 10 times taller than those today. It's a pre-flood world. We'll get to that eventually, Lord one. Uh, the forest is one of the world's oldest tropical rainforests, preserved 250 feet below the surface. Scientists are surprised by the size of this fossil bed, which they believe to came about as a, a result of some freak fortuitous event. I'll sacrifice one more piece of gum. Who wants it? Uh, Lori gets it. Too late, Joey. Right. Uh, hey. Anyway, let's move on. In the past decade, as miners excavated room after room, they began to notice imprints of the leaves, logs, and stumps in the ceiling. Some stumps were five feet in diameter, diameter, and one log was more than 100 feet long. Okay, and these are the remnants of extinct plants and very bizarre to modern eyes that we don't have them today. It's part of the pre-flood world. A geologist at the University of Bristol said, "Quote: There are some." These are some of the earliest known rainforests on our planet. It was like something out of a Jules Verne novel book or something. Isn't that wild? In the ceiling in a coal mine 250 feet down. But that's still not the uh, half of it. What's extraordinary about this discovery is that this forest has been preserved in the growth position. It's an upright forest with this tree still standing upright. So something literally came across at certain times came and just sheared the trees right off. And other times, it just went there and just dumped on it and just preserved everything literally the way it was. Mass on a massive scale. And the mining continues today, and they say the size of the forest grows by the day. So maybe it's more than four square miles. That's nothing. I want to show you this picture. This is an actual map. Some of the plant remains they find are so big, they cover an area of over 100,000 square miles. It's like something on a scale that we can't even dream. All of a sudden, just came hit the land, grabbed the vegetation, took it in one fell swoop, and went boom, and buried it for us uh, today. Anybody, how many guys would say it's probably a, a flood? Okay, sorry, you'll have to get the gum later. Uh, but anyway, but this is the point, okay? Uh, contrary to what the scoffers say, folks, we are not a bunch of brainwashed idiots, okay, who don't deal with the facts. We're the ones dealing with the facts, okay? The problem is you just don't like the fact that the facts agree with the Bible, and you're scoffing at it, Okay? And one guy said this, listen to this. He says, listen, nowhere on earth today, nowhere, do we have fossils forming on the scale uh, that we see in the geological deposits. Nowhere. He said, for instance, a million fish today can be killed in the red tides in the Gulf of Mexico, but they simply decay away. They don't become fossil, right? Why aren't fossils being formed today on this massive scale? Right? Exactly, right? And he says, an immense worldwide catastrophe occurred in the past. It produced the Sicilian hippopotamus beds, the great mammal beds of the Rockies, the dinosaur beds in the Black Hills, and the Rockies and the Gobi Desert, the fish beds, the Baltic amber beds, and hundreds more. Quote, none of this fossil making is being done today. It only happened one time in the history of mankind. I wonder what caused that. You're scared to say it because I said I have ran out of gum, but it is, that's right, a flood. All right, thank you for listening. Uh, but anyway, but anyway, but this is the reason why, folks, that you and I, we don't need to shrink back when people want to sit here. And, and I understand this because I used to be that person. You Christians are a bunch of dumb idiots. You're so intellectually inept that you're brainwashed that you have to have some book tell you what to do. I was the hypocrite because I didn't investigate the facts, let alone even read the Bible. So who in the world was I to try to give this impression that I was an authority on the Bible and could point a finger at Christians when I myself never even picked up the Bible, let alone investigate the facts. 
And that's what a world does today. They got the power of Hollywood, they got the power of the educational system and the media behind them, and they just keep spouting off a bunch of scoffing evidences against you and I uh, without checking out the facts themselves, including these guys who also are here in Vegas. See if you recognize these scoffers of the Bible. Let's take a look. Tonight, we're going to take you through the Bible and show you that it's full of inaccuracies, inconsistencies, and outright impossibilities, that it's more fiction than fact, and that ain't If you're religious and you believe the Bible is real because of faith, we can't touch you. It's an automatic tie. No one can bust you. Bible nuts pride themselves on believing in things that are hard to believe in. They think God will bless them for that. But if faith isn't enough, if you want history or fact in your Bible, you are so The more we learn about archaeology and history of biblical times, the more we realize that most of the stuff in the Bible is fiction. It's an article of faith. It's part of a religious belief system that really doesn't fit the way we think when we think scientifically and we live in the age of science where we're supposed to ask for evidence and challenge beliefs. Now it's time to turn to Genesis 6, 11 through 13, Noah's Ark. This is just ridiculous. It is so ridiculous, I find it embarrassing uh, for people who attempt to prove that it's true. The Noah thing is probably a mixture of stories about a flood that really happened on the Euphrates River about 125 miles southeast of present-day Baghdad. People are very good at rationalizing things they came to believe for non-smart reasons. Whatever you do, don't read the Bible for a moral code. It advocates prejudice, cruelty, superstition, and murder. Read it because we need more atheists, and nothing will get you there faster than reading the Bible. You wonder why I'm preaching against evolution. This is what they're doing to us. Now, notice where the real hypocrisy lies. He says, I can't believe anybody will believe in that account of Noah. And that people who believe it are believing it for non-smart reasons. Now, notice how they didn't give any evidence to back any of their claims up. And notice that he wasn't even sure. Well, Noah's flood was probably a local flood in the river Euphrates. But really, what's your evidence? What do we do tonight? What have we been doing in our study? Yes, we're looking at the scripture, but what are we doing? We're putting it to the test, looking at the facts. The facts agree with the biblical account and only the biblical account. So who's the one who's really being willingly ignorant and embarrassing? Them. Now here's the problem. Our world doesn't know that. Our world is not going to get it from those guys. Three million people visit Las Vegas from around the world every month. How many of them go to those guys' show? How many of them watch the History Channel around the world today? How many of them are in secular education that promote evolution? Where's the only place that our society is going to learn this information that backs up the scripture? Uh, this is why I'm doing it. Because there's a war out there, and they're using this against us to make us look like a bunch of brainwashed idiots so they can move to the next step, and that's called persecution. But if we're going to make a difference, it's up to us to let them know these facts. Remove the scales of ignorance and tell them about Jesus before it's too late. Because God judged this planet once, and he's getting ready to do it again. We're seeing a repeat of Noah's day with the wickedness and the skeptical scoffing society. And we need to get out there telling people about Jesus, at least give them a chance to say yes before it's too late. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. 
And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief. Okay, the Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how... Uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word. Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay, and folks, let's be honest, we've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you, that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind, he knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. 
And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.